I'm going to go ahead and get things started. We've got uh, some people joining in, which is really, really exciting. Um, we've got a killer set of panelists today. I am honestly, truly humbled to be in the same chat in the same room as all three of you today. Um, this is like the all-star cast of CS. So uh, really, really excited, humbled, and um, really, really stoked to be able to learn from each of you today. Um, so for, for anyone that is joining, and as we kind of kick things off, as a reminder, today's masterclass is heavily focused on unlocking customer growth, account growth, um, what it looks like in the post-sales environment. Um, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, I live and breathe in the kind of like the strategic end, um, have roots in PLG, but have kind of bridged the two together over the course of my career um, and seen significant kind of opportunities on both ends of the scale. So we've got a killer cast of panelists today that have experience in both ends of that. Um, so a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm Ian, I'm the head of CS at Accord and uh, just recently joined the team. So drinking from a fire hose right now, learning, building, a lot of the cool stuff, early days CS. So if anyone has questions around um, building a team, uh, that is what I love to do. And uh, prior to that, I was the founding CS lead at Loom, early days. So about um, when we were about five employees or so. So I've seen kind of the early days of PLG through uh, tons of growth um, and excited to, to share some experiences along the way, but more excited to learn from each of you. So I'm going to kick it off. Uh, maybe I'll pass it to Paige to do a quick intro and then Paige, feel free to pass it on to, uh, to the next panelist too. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. Um, super excited to be a part of this panel. Um, just echoing what Ian said, just surrounded by greatness. Um, so uh, looking forward to a great conversation. Um, I am currently with Groove. Um, for those of you who don't know um, what Groove is, we are a sales efficiency platform. Um, I've been with Groove for about Little, little under two years, um, I head up the CS group as well as the account management group um, at Groove. Prior to moving over, I spent 17 years at a company called Mintel. Um, 14 of those years built and developed a CS org. Um, I, I always kind of joke because when we started that path, I don't think CS was an actual thing. Um, so we called it a lot of different things and we kind of developed it in a really organic way, made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of great decisions along the way, but it was super exciting time for me. So super happy to be here and I'm gonna pass it over to Jonathan. Awesome, thanks Paige. Uh, yeah, really, really happy to be here. Uh, and after almost two years working together with Ian, it's a real pleasure to be uh, on a panel together. Uh, everybody, I'm Jonathan Sousa. I have uh, spent the last 10 years building, scaling, leading customer success functions at places like Dropbox, Scoop, and Loom. Uh, today, my family and I live in Portugal, and I am consulting early stage companies on building great customer success motions. Uh, so that's that's what I'm up to and uh, really excited to be on the panel today and hopefully share some good insights from my past and, and hear what uh, Monica and Paige uh, can share as well. Uh, I'll pass it over to Monica. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Hey, everyone. Also super pumped to be alongside all of you today. Um, I'm Monica. I head up our customer success function here at Notion. For those of you that are not familiar with Notion, we like to call ourselves an all-in-one workspace for your company's docs, knowledge management, and project management. Um, early hire at Notion, really got to see it in the zero to one phase. I was kind of one of the first 50 employees um, and we've grown quite a bit today into the hundreds. Um, prior to Notion, I was at a similar kind of documentation productivity platform leading CS there, kind of DocuSign competitor. So, so always in this productivity PLG space, I'm really glad. Uh, I was an early hire at that startup as well. So that one was kind of seeing the pre-revenue to 10 million kind of growth trajectory and then coming to Notion, seeing that, you know, upwards to 100 million growth trajectory. So kind of different stages of startups and CS. Awesome. This is uh, definitely what I said, humbled to be in the presence of each of you, just hearing your background super briefly. That is, uh, that's awesome. Uh, and I know uh, just looking at the chat on the right-hand side, really excited to see that everyone's calling from all parts of North America, some in Europe, which is great. Um, being remote uh, for the past kind of five years and now moving to hybrid back in office, which is great. 
and near and dear to my heart to be able to see and communicate with uh, people from the CS community all over, which is great, uh, super exciting. So before we dive in and really get to the meat of the conversation today, I wanted to kick things off with a quick icebreaker. Um, and this is a question that is tied to the culture of Accord. So as I'm learning, uh, a little bit more about my fellow colleagues. Really, really exciting. I'm actually going to be meeting all of them for the first time in Toronto in a month at our first offsite that I'll be joining. Um, apparently, we have an affinity for karaoke, which I'll learn very, very soon. Uh, so first question to kick things off in a great tone is, if you had a go-to karaoke song, what would it be? Paige, I'll kick it off to you. Um, I will survive. By Gloria Gaynor. I mean, probably everybody's go-to karaoke song. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm putting it on. I haven't, I haven't heard that in a minute. So exactly, yeah, <laughs> put it on your list. Yeah. Right. Jonathan, what about you? That's a good, a good choice for uh, tough days and customer success land. <laughs> um, yeah. Mine is uh, I want it that way. Yes. Like, <laughs> Great I too. love it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely classic for sure. Um, is that is that a off karaoke tune as well? Just kind of maybe in the car. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, love it. Yeah, old uh, but goodie. Monica, <laughs> Monica, what about you? Yeah, I'm thinking about how can I take the audience on a journey and be as obnoxious as possible. So I'm thinking Do Hotel it. California. It's like <laughs> the longest song ever <laughs> with an interlude where I don't have to sing anything. That sounds good. I. Uh... I love I love the like power ballads and the really long songs. Um, and the way she just said, taking the uh, the team on a journey here too reminds me. So I shared one of these in, a, in one of my first all hands at Accord, and it was uh, Celine Dion. It's all coming back to me now. Guaranteed go to love power ballads, uh, but also a very very long song, and we actually play it in our all hands. Um, and didn't realize that I forgot it was a seven minute song. So people are kind of like, when should we <laughs> this? Uh, but I digress. Really, really good time. Um, super cool to see in the chat here. These are some great songs. Miss Jackson, Hotel California as well, uh, which is great. Anything ABBA, 100%. Those are great tunes. Was listening to ABBA up north the other weekend. Um, well, awesome. Appreciate the, uh, the insight here. I definitely have some new songs to add to Spotify, which is really exciting. Uh, but want to maybe make a large pivot into the world of CS. Maybe not so much because a lot of these tunes definitely fuel uh, some of the stuff that uh, we're going through, whether it's expansions, turns, a good playlist can cure all, which is great. Um, but to kick things off, I think setting the stage around the current environment in CS um, and some trends might be a, a really, really good thing to, to dive into. Um, I think the landscape in CS in post-sale environment is changing um, dramatically over the past few years, especially post-COVID. Uh, so maybe we can start with a high level. What patterns or trends are, are you seeing in CS today? Um, I think something that we're seeing consistently is the industry catching up and realize that revenue impact that CS can actually have uh, and be really, really curious to capture your thoughts. So Monica, maybe we can start it off with you. Would love to hear. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this and super happy to kick things off. I think especially this year, I'm seeing two, two major things. One is a renewed sense of focus on existing business and this idea that, you know, holding the base is super important, if not more important than maybe top of funnel stuff, which, which was a little bit more attractive, I would say, in previous years before the macro. So seeing a lot of focus on existing customer business and what we can do to continue to invest in that and make sure that we're holding which is great for CS. We've always existed in this space. Some of the things I've been yelling about for years are, are finally getting paid attention to and, and finally getting some importance. So it's a real opportunity to kind of educate the business on what we're seeing on the existing business side, what are the opportunities and gaps there. Um, and I'm seeing a lot more just general investments in post sales enablement, right? So how can we make sure that we support these customers, onboard them, like holding these customers is especially now obviously much more important, but we understand that it's much more expensive if we don't keep them. So CS kind of has a, a renewed spotlight on us and we have a great opportunity to to share what we've seen through the years. So that's that's one, it's existing customer kind of revenue, existing business. The second one is 
a focus on helping communicate value to our customers. Um, and I know that's kind of like a big buzzword, but it's really becoming much more tangible and practical, especially this year. Um, we've seen cases where churn and contraction happen because we were not able to articulate the business value that the customer was receiving or they themselves were not understanding the business value. I think in prior years, it was really easy and attractive to talk about feature set and sparkly new things that we've added and, and keep it at the feature level. But I think now more than ever, it's going to be about the value that they're experiencing, that your customers are experiencing for their objectives and for their bottom line. And so we've actually had to operationalize this as a team, as a CS team. Of course, we track usage, we track health utilization, but we're also tracking what are the customer's business outcomes, which are actually different for every customer like and articulated differently. But how do we make sure we have a strong sense of what that looks like? And we are repeating that back and checking that in with the customer at every touch point that we're able to have. Um, so we're kind of speaking their language now. It's no longer a focus on our product and what how shiny our product is, but it really is the focus is on the customer. What do you understand? What's important to you? Awesome. Yeah, I, re I really love that last piece. Um, I think when in an environment where every dollar counts, the the alignment, and we'll probably touch on this on most questions that we talk about today, is that how does it actually solve business value and drive business value versus the the classic like we've released a feature. Here's what it does. Right? How does that actually then tie back to uh, the customer? for actually solutioning something that they're against. So um, really love that piece. Um, Jonathan, would love to hear your thoughts on this one too. Yeah, I, I echo a lot of what Monica says, I think is very well said. I think um, it's it's about doing more with less right now. And, uh, and again, emphasis on value. That's the exact same thing I would have said actually. Well done, Monica. Well done. But the uh, the piece about value is really interesting because it's there, it's now easier to start a company than ever before, and so you can stand up technology, build a product, and 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 try to get that out to market. Um, and so buyers have uh, a wider range of options and choices than they've ever had before. And so you have to think about different ways of differentiating. I mean, there's some differentiation obviously that can take place within product features. I think though that customer success can be this like ace in the hole. And I've, you know, I think in, in my past to try to orient the customer success teams around being that differentiator. And I think, you know, as we'll we'll talk about, I guess, through the conversation, there are differently ways of turning customer success and your your company from being just a vendor to being an actual partner and something that's embedded within the customer business. I think that applies. Uh, whether it's a high touch motion or whether that's a scaled motion. And it all does come back down to this idea of a value and alignment with what the customers are trying to accomplish and then really working in a targeted way to get them to that, to that goal. Love it. I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff we saw that the parallels to at Loom and as we were like our time when we were trying to figure out how do we scale this out to a large book of business across the different segments becomes really, uh, really difficult over time too. And uh, we've got some questions in here that we want to tailor our, our journey to as we think about like enterprise versus SMB versus mid market. Um, really thoughtful. I appreciate that. Paige, love to hear on your, your end as well. Just some big themes. I think, um, again, echoing what Jonathan and Monica have already said but also just in really recent months is there's just a more critical lens from people beyond just our champions. Um, so we have worked really closely with our, our champion for a very long time. And right now, just because of the economic difficulties that we're faced with, we've got other people that are participating in the, um, in the buying decision um, or the renewing decision-making process. And so data is critical. And that value to Jonathan's point, really showing the value through data is gonna get the attention of those individuals that um, are within the buying committee or are the influencers. So we've gotta get the attention of those individuals and the best way to do it is to really hone in on that data. And, and to Monica's point, really understand what outcomes are important to people, not only our champions, but those individuals that maybe haven't been participating in the relationship quite all the way through the journey and they're just getting into it right now. So it really, um, it's a fun time. Um, to resell 
the product um, or resell the solution uh, to new individuals. And that's something that uh, CS hasn't always had to do because we've had these consistent relationships with our champions. Um, so it's adding an element to an already very full plate of CS. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the continuous plate evolution of CS, mm -hmm. the everything department that we can sometimes be labeled as, um, but Paige, I, I really like your point around, um, the almost it's, it's an extension of the buying committee, right? Buying committees have expanded over the past number of years significantly that then extends into, uh, the post-sales environment to say, Hey, you know, people have interests in what this solution brings. We ha now have exponentially more stakeholders as part of the, the process as we're working with our customers. Um, so perfect segue into kind of the next question that I wanted to pose, and maybe Paige, you can kick us off on this one, is um, specifically around ensuring the customer's exact level challenges are being addressed um, throughout the customer lifecycle and not just after the signing, signing of the deal. How do we ensure that that happens with our customers? Sure. I'll try to avoid being long-winded on this because I think that um, it certainly warrants a big, big conversation. This is a, a big topic um, that's top of mind for us. Um, but it really starts in the pre-sales motion, right? So we use a sales qualification framework. We use Medic. There are several other frameworks that you can apply, but it starts with that to know who those stakeholders are, what are their pain points, why are they buying in the first place, why are they investing, and then we carry that through into post sales with our CS and account management teams, and we apply that by taking all that great information that we learn on the upfront, and we apply that to creating their success plan. And their success plan, the way that we identify success plans is this is a mutually agreed to roadmap for success. This is where we cover off and understand what are your key objectives? What is keeping you up at night? Um, what are your departmental goals? All those different goals and, and uh, as we were saying, those desired outcomes. But also, who else should we be working with throughout the organization? Um, and beyond that, how are you going to measure us um, when you start to think about staying with us as partners? Um, what are those measurements? Is it all metric driven? Is it adoption uh, rates? What is it? And we revisit those success plans on a regular basis, um, minimum every two months, um, so that we really are, again, checking in, rechecking. And when I say it's a mutually agreed to plan, we're constantly iterating on those success plans. And then that feeds nicely into our executive business reviews that we do less frequently, but we do them with those stakeholders that maybe are, uh, that go beyond our champions um, so that we can then reinforce and retell those new stakeholders or different stakeholders, all of the things that are important to their teams and show that value within those business reviews. Um, so that's how, that's one method. I'm sure that there are several other methods. So that's the beauty of it. There's so many. Um, it just like one small nuance too that you mentioned, which I absolutely love. Um, and maybe this is just a personal thing, but I avoid the term QBR. I feel like it has a negative connotation. I don't know how you guys feel. We can definitely talk about that. But you mentioned executive business review, executive business briefing. Um, it has a layer of being able to connect with the right folks as we're thinking about um, connecting with stakeholders, driving executive initiatives, but also removing the necessity of a cadence for it. Like what works for your customer for driving that? So just a small thing that I was like, I love that page. Thank you. I don't know if you, how, if you have a uh, an aversion to the word QBR or the, the cadence of it, but uh, that's on my end too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would just add just one layer of that is I think it's critical to have executive sponsors both within your own team and their team so that they can have an executive to executive conversation, not just at the point of risk, not just at the point of potential loss, but all the way through the customer journey. So that the second that renewal is signed, that new business is signed, establish a relationship with one of the executives in your company, with their company, um, where it makes sense. 
Um, and I'd add one the, really tactical thing because Paige mentioned this all starts pre-sale and then we try to capture that throughout the life cycle 100 percent and one recent kind of adaptation we've had to do as a CS team is change the way that we talk about success metrics to the customer and make them as tailored as possible to the customer's objective. So I think previously your classic kind of executive business review is like looking at success metrics in your product. Okay, this many people are logging in, this many people are using it, you're ahead of the benchmark, you're behind the benchmark. And again, that's very product, your company centric. And what we've done is we capture the customer's business objectives during that sales cycle, during that kickoff, um, their desired outcomes with our product. And then we make sure to find metrics that are most closely mapped to those objectives. And those are the metrics that we share rather than kind of just general health metrics with the account. Um, so an example is, you know, a customer wants to, like in the case of Notion's product, um, create a customer or create an employee handbook that everyone is accessing and, and reading about their company policies and up to date on the latest internal kind of employee guidelines. Um, rather than saying, oh, everyone's logging in, that's great. We actually say, hey, your most viewed page is that number one policy document. And we see that on average, the majority are viewing that page once a month. Um, but this other page is not getting that many views. Let's, how can we boost that up? Is this an important term or an important document? How can we increase the search terms around it? So we're actually trying to find the, the metrics that are most closely aligned to those objectives rather than kind of the classic benchmarking we've done in the past. That's awesome. Yeah, the specifics I think are, are really, really important as it relates to, again, your customer. Like what is the driving value for them versus the vanity metric that might be us that we might report to the board to say, hey, you know, this might be not necessarily vanity, but it's like the product metric that we're evaluating internally versus what is actually driving value for our individual customer. Uh, I love that. Jonathan, would love to get your thoughts on that too. Yeah, I was just, just going to add on to that. It reminded me of a conversation we had as our CS, CX leadership team at Loom. And it was focused on uh, uh, essentially what's called the platinum rule. And so for those of you out there who aren't familiar with this, or maybe, or maybe everybody's familiar with the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The platinum rule takes that one step further. It's a lot more empathetic and it's uh, do unto others as you as they would want done unto them. So it's really about thinking about the position that your customer is in and what kind of experience they would want to have, what kind of metrics they would want to see. And I think that if you're able to craft your customer journey and the different touch points along the customer journey, the data that you're sharing, the relationships that you're building and how you're engaging with the team, then you're really crafting something that the customer says, wow, this is somebody who really understands me for my position that I'm in and my business and they feel like there's just a greater connect connectivity relationship trust and partnership with uh with you and your customer success team so i guess that's the only insight that i'd share as a as kind of a north star for building an effective customer journey and a lot of the different motions along the way i love that i've definitely stolen that from you uh in the past which is great and i've applied it now so it's and there's an extension of that which i love which is uh, like empathy mapping in design work and how do you want your customers to actually feel at every point of, of the journey? Um, and what does that experience actually look like and feel like um, at every point? So obsessing it over, over it right now, uh, which is, I'm in the thick of it, which is exciting. Um, awesome. I wanted to, to dive into a little bit more of the specifics around um, some of the tactics that we think about when we're thinking about maybe a little bit more upmarket, but I think it actually starts to apply to SMB and mid-market as you think about the structure of scale too. Um, and that is definitely tied to the topic of our masterclass, which is account planning. Um, so Jonathan, maybe this is a, a question I can get you to touch on first in terms of like either successful stories or how you've seen this work out really well for existing customers, customers you've worked yep. with. Um, would love to hear some some stories on your end. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think there's a lot of variation across customer segments, um, but there's a, a really good story that has a good payoff and it ties into some of the, the points that uh, Paige and Monica have mentioned as well, particularly around stakeholders and engaging the right stakeholders at the right time. And sometimes there are executives that just come in out of nowhere and 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 so you've got to be prepared everywhere else because maybe that executive has been uh, unreachable. Okay, so 
Uh, I led customer success at Scoop. Uh, Scoop was a carpool program and we'd sell to the largest employers that we could find. We had a relatively small portfolio of really large customers. So, and I don't know that the customer book of business ever got bigger than 150 or so customers, um, but we we're doing tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue. So it was, it was very concentrated. Um, and so given the size of these contracts, it was really important for us to build a plan, map to key stakeholder relationships and bring visibility to the plan and to the metrics that the customers were looking to achieve um, in order to have any degree of success with them. And so uh, one customer where this worked out really well was, um, was Tesla. Um, so out, over years of working with the team at Tesla, you know, we started working with them in um, kind of when I started, it was 2017. They were about $125,000 in, in revenue annually. Uh, over about three years, we grew the partnership 37x and uh, in terms of revenue and in terms of impact. And so it became one of Scoop's largest, healthiest, most impactful accounts. But obviously with that level of growth, you start to attract a lot of attention. And as we approached a particular renewal, uh, this line got uh, Elon's eye. And so he was wondering why, if they've transformed the electric vehicle market and they've put people into space, why couldn't they develop their own carpool network and save the, the millions that they were spending on our program? And so he developed, he demanded a review of the program. And, uh, and this is where our account planning and our relationship mapping was really important. The first thing we'd done was really develop an account plan based on the customer's goals. And so the CSM there, uh, who actually you and I worked very closely with at Loom, uh, was very diligent around um, understanding the customer success criteria um, that they'd set out and, and showing as we'd hit and exceed Tesla's expectations along each part of the, the journey. And so different business reviews, we set up a cadence of, of data feeds to them that would show them impact that we were driving, impact versus other benchmarks, um, and essentially just building a sense of a lot of value that our program was delivering. And this helped our stakeholders get really familiar and essentially inherently understand what we were doing and the impact we were driving for the business as they had set out for. National. Uh, around going vertically. So up within the main organization that was managing our relationship, which was more of a facilities group, uh, tasked with how do we get people, like tens of thousands of people to campus every day, um, but also horizontally. So we looked at, okay, what are the different areas that our product is benefiting Tesla and different organizations across Tesla? Are we impacting employer retention? Great, now, we are, now we're in an HR team. Are we impacting sustainability goals? Great, yes, there's obviously alignment there as well. And so what we did was start to map those relationships, identify who those people were and start to build relationships into them. So when push came to shove uh, and Elon is sitting there being like, well, why don't we develop this thing uh, on our own? We were able to use the impact we were delivering, the like tangible metrics of it, the relationships that we built, and then we'd set up pricing and packaging as well. It was aligned to reward Tesla as they grew. And so that really made sure that everybody was satisfied across the business, finance, HR, sustainability, facilities, and we were able to essentially hold our position and renew them for another three years. So I think if it's done well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be a pretty powerful thing. That's huge. Uh, the, the impacts and the, the turnover too, as you're thinking about of where it started to where it ultimately ended up, um, be curious to get your thoughts as like, we dig into this a little bit more, cause I mean, it, it's definitely a lighthouse customer and everyone knows Tesla, which is uh, really, really awesome. Yeah. How, how did you think about the, the impact of, you know, stakeholder mapping, account planning as from a priority perspective, how impactful was that to the outcome that you guys had? So if we're looking at the tactics and we've got, you know, all of these things that a CSM can do on an account, how important is that piece of the puzzle? Yeah, it was, it was I mean, it was key. It was critical. It was what our CSM was spending most of her time doing. Um, when you've got accounts of that size, you're relatively small book of business. And so heavily concentrated focus on a few accounts. Um, one of the very, very simple tactical things that I'd recommend anybody who's managing high touch accounts to do is to set aside at least an hour, call it every month, maybe biweekly, but just an hour of blank space for you to spend time thinking about your account, understand the customer, what they're selling, what their stock price is doing, who's the executive team, what's the latest news that you've read about them, who are their competitors, get to know that business inside and out. And so we really understood 
at particular at that point in time, Tesla was trying to launch the Model 3. They were having employees that were up in arms about working conditions. They were sticking a tent in the parking lot so they could produce more cars overnight. Elon was sleeping on the factory floor. Like we knew the dynamics of the relationship were interesting to say the least because there was this massive cash constraint, but also this desire to drive significant growth as fast as possible. And they were hiring like crazy. And so literally just sheer amount of space in a parking lot couldn't fit their employees in. So you start asking the questions like, well, why, how are you getting people to work? Well, we're investing in a bus program. Ah, tell me more about that. Well, you know, our buses, we run a huge fleet of them. I'm not going to share the numbers, but huge, multi, multi millions in, in fleets. Uh, okay, great. What's the capacity of these buses? Well, it's like 70, 80 people per bus. And how full are they? Well, not so good. 50 to 60%, depending on the route, some are 30%. So you're sitting there being like, okay, for a company that's focused on efficiency and keeping their dollars and their spend low, they're throwing money out on the freeway every single day. Isn't there a better way for us to bring in a solution that is that they're using, that hits their sustainability goals, that helps keep their employees a little bit more happy, right? And so we really try to target a lot of those themes, but those themes were based on the CSM's deep thoughtfulness about the account, the customer, what matters to them, what matters to their team, all the different relationships around the board. So I think it was like, I mean, that was the majority of where we spent the time. It wasn't in product enablement really, because it's very easy to sign up for the product. You know, obviously that's going to vary by, by company, right? But for us, it was really, really about driving behavior change, getting more people into the cars and then showing the value of what we we're delivering so that we could continue to grow the relationship and drive the impact for the customer. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of that behavior change ultimately starts with those relationships and the trust that you have to build to get access to the behavior change that needs to happen. Um, also, hot tip, uh, booking time on your week for any CSM to do that separate mm -hmm. strategic high level thinking. Incredible. Extra hot tip for this, that playlist that we were talking about for Spotify, all those karaoke songs, add them. It'll uh, add fuel to the fire, keep you going get those creative juices flowing for that strategic uh, thinking time. So um, it was a really, really good piece of advice someone shared with me at one point in time, which is great. Uh, Paige or Monica, would love to get your thoughts. Um, feel free to jump in around the, the account planning and stakeholder mapping as we're thinking about this topic, um, you know, from the perspective of either uh, past experience or customers that you've had worked with, or just in general, from like an operational standpoint, um, would love to hear your thoughts about the impact that has for post-sales in CS. I can dive in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Monica. Thank you. I can talk about it a little bit from the kind of PLG sort of bottoms up viral growth perspective, because I think it's a, a blessing and a curse that um, we often feel in kind of sales led functions. And so for Notion specifically, um, when we think about stakeholder mapping, we have our kind of classic stakeholders and classic key contacts that you would think about in terms of the, the right decision makers, the right champions, but it's a never ending process and it's constantly evolving because we do have kind of like a product led growth model. Um, so what we've had to do is be very strategic about who we target and why, and really stick to what we know works and what we know resonates. And so for Notion specifically, we have a pretty strong ICP. Um, and it's function or persona based. So we work really well with, we call them engineering product and design leaders. I think our go-to-market user base is kind of secondary to that. And so what we've done is building stakeholders by leading with value in the product, um, as we've talked about. So what we've developed over the last couple of quarters are playbooks for our key personas and like a deep understanding of what these personas care about, what challenges are they up against, what are they trying to solve? And then how our product can actually help solve them. And so we're kind of building an army of these kind of punk, uh, functional stakeholders. And we specifically target more senior levels. So we'll target like manager and above or director level above in the case that we really need to kind of create new champions and create and map out that organization for greater expansion. So one thing that we might do is think about an account where we want to expand more into like their product or design departments, for example. Um, we have really strong examples for product and design leaders. We kind of, we have an understanding of their pain points. So as a CSM, I would lead with that value. I'd reach out to a high level product leader and I would say, hey, like in the past year, I've helped product leaders build a high visibility roadmap, 
create templates for all of their PRDs and, you know, insert third item here where you are the true consultant and the true expert. Let's do that. Like, how are you solving this? Like, let me actually give you something to work with immediately. And um, we try to be very clear, like it's we're every all of us here, I'm sure have received kind of these like salesy kind of SDR emails and we're trying to stay away from sounding like that, but really consultative advisory. And then that meeting is beneficial in two ways. It gives us intel into that organization. It gives us a new person that can champion for us and kind of understand what's going on and how can we start to design the hallways of that company. Um, but it, it allows us to give them something to walk away with really quickly. In our case, it's a working session. We give them um, a use case and a template that's custom that they can implement pretty, pretty quickly. So for us, it's all about like tailoring it down to the right persona tailoring it down to the right level and then leading with value. And then we start kind of building that army of champions. I love that. It, I, I think I love that you have got the PLG perspective on this too, because it's so important to bridge the two. Um, and it speaks at any level of working with customers, segmentation, personalization, how you're thinking about it related to what is going to land for that particular vertical customer persona um, is so important because the one size fits all just doesn't work. Um, and we see that consistently. So I appreciate the, the thoughts of Monica. Um, Paige, would love to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, super similar to what Monica mentioned is we have really um, specific personas that we work with that you, you uh, so I can't underscore enough the importance of having those playbooks by persona um, because you can give them a list of potential use cases. You don't have to ask the question, how do you want to use this? Or how will you use this? Or what value will this provide you? But you can come at it from a different angle and say, in our experience, this is how you're, you will find success from using this. Um, so I think that changes the conversation just ever so slightly so that you then create that trust um, and rapport to position yourself as, or, or the CSM is able to position themselves as a trusted advisor, as a consultant, rather than just, you know, another vendor partner. Um, and that opens up the door um, for really transparent um, account mapping with your champions. If they trust you, they'll open up so you can do some account mapping with them. Um, and that's why that's a component of our success plan motion is talk to me about your organization. This is who we're working with right now, but who else should we be working with? So rather than just us traditionally networking and using all of the resources and platforms available to do that, it's let's do this together because I want to make you look really good in front of your colleagues. So let's expand the relationship that way. Um, so. I love that. That is uh, that is one of my favorite tactics, best practices, is getting to the point of trust with your champion to say, hey, here's an inside look at your organization. Um, where am I going wrong? Where do I need to spend time? Um, am I going to spin my wheels going in this direction? And more often than not, um, what we'll find is the leaning into that exercise from your champion is going to make them look great, right? It's going to make you have a trusted relationship. You're going to actually drive value for them. They're the ones sticking their neck out to say, hey, this solution is what I brought to the company. Um, so we can get to that point with your champion. I think you unlock a ton of value. Um, so I know this was actually one of the questions in the chat was uh, around best practices for account mapping. One of my absolute favorites is getting to that point with your, your champion to be able to screen share um, an account map and say, what does this look like? What does this look like to you? Where am I missing? What are the gaps? Um, any other best practices that you guys would share when you're thinking about account planning, stakeholder mapping um, that have worked really, really well for you? Um, Jonathan might kick it back to you for, for this one. Yeah. Um... I, beyond what's been said, I, I have one that, that I use at certain times. Uh, and it's, and it's, it sometimes catches the stakeholder off guard a little bit. Um, but I've found that my hit rate on this being an effective question is, uh, is really high. And so I I'd encourage you to think about the use of it and then use it and see what happens. Um, but asking somebody, uh, particularly in like a renewal conversation, but also just like in a general conversation, like, um, what is, 
Um, what does this, what does a, uh, what's, uh, from a renewal standpoint, what is uh, the right contract look like for you at renewal? And so it might not be anything that you're trying to pitch, but really you get some honest insight uh, by asking like, all right, look, in a night, rip our, rip our contract apart. Like what should this look like for you? And then the, the thing that's important there is it really helps close the gap between where you're, what you're trying to pitch and what they might be trying to say. But the second question, which I think hones a little bit more closely to what you're asking, is asking them um, what gets you promoted and seeing what they say. And that's that's the interesting question, because then typically you'll get like a laugh and then they'll say, huh. And they know uh, they're people. They want promotions. And uh, and and uh, typically you'll get some pretty interesting answers there. And it really cuts close to the bone in terms of what matters to them from a personal standpoint within the context of their business. And so sometimes it'll be like, well, look, I want to come back with a better deal, or I want to be able to get this, this program that we're trying to deliver to the company out to everybody. And that will make, you know, my name stand out at the top of the heap when it's time to get promoted. Um, it's a bit of a cheeky question, but I do think that it, it generates some pretty interesting responses. And um, yeah, I don't know if you're smirking or you just have a, a nice, happy, handsome face there, but you and I were in a meeting with Lattice, if you recall, and, uh, and had, and had that nice conversation with the stakeholder and the response we got back was incredible, but it changed the entire dynamic of that relationship. So anyway, that's when I kind of keep up the sleeve. Awesome. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I think the, I think in the front end of the cycle too, with sales, they talk about the challenger sale. Um, and being able to challenge your customers and ask the hard hitting questions. Um, at times it, ne it isn't, it isn't necessarily about just kind of making your customers successful and doing exactly what they want. You have to push them in certain directions where you see value to open up doors, to actually build a relationship, to get to the point where you're driving business change. Um, and, uh, asking those tough, tough questions, I think unlocks a lot, um, but it also builds a ton of trust with your customer once they see that you're like really leaning in to get to the, uh, not kind of the surface level, but what can we do to drive change? Um, so I love that. It's awesome. Um, being thoughtful of time. I know this has been a super, super engaging conversation. We've got about two minutes left, um, losing track of it, which is great. So I wanted to, um, first take a quick look at the chat to make sure we're answering everyone's questions. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions for these amazing panelists, feel free to drop them in. Um, wanted to look at this last one right here. Have you run into pushback? Uh, I love the point on asking your champions for direction on where you're planning to go into the organization. Have you run into pushback with that or gatekeeping, for example, where they don't want to lose control? Um, would love, if anyone's got perspective on this, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the scariest part of asking that question is you run into a gatekeeper and admittedly, I've run into plenty of gatekeepers, but I think that goes back to what Jonathan was implying with his question is, what can I do to make you look really good? And here's an example of how I work with other customers with you know similar concerns. Um, and and be empathetic forward. <laughs> you know, show lead with empathy and say like I understand this is this might be a difficult question for you to answer for me, but this is why I'm asking this is is to make your life a lot easier. So if you can start with that approach, I mean you are going to run into gatekeepers. You are not always going to get the answer um, that you're looking for. But if you don't try, you'll never know. Um, so you have to at least ask it. But I, I don't know if there's a silver bullet to get past just a really strict gatekeeper. But Yeah, when I speak to my CSMs and we're kind of doing this contact mapping, stakeholder mapping, I'd prefer honesty straight up so that we can move forward rather than trying to like figure out or turn around a situation that might not have any possibility. So we very quickly go through the contacts and they say, hey, this person's a, a power user, but they're never going to be a champion for us. They don't want to put, you know, put their uh, skin in the game in terms of expanding this internally. And they will create that designation as quickly as they understand that. So I'm like, okay, great. They're not going to be a champion for us. Who's the next best person? Mm -hmm. So I think we're pretty honest in that sense. Um, but one thing that I encourage my team to do is is um, help the, the champion understand how the 
product is actually much more valuable if we're actually able to get more people using it. At, at least that's the case with with a product like Notion. We talk about the network effect. We talk about how like everyone is much more productive and collaborative if we're all working in the same tool. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so it's beneficial to start creating this network effect as early as we can. So not trying to come across like, hey, tell me who's who I'm going to go in and sell to them, but like tell them how it also expands like the ability and the capabilities of your product by doing so. So I think that's a helpful perspective um, to kind of reduce those silos. And then, as I mentioned before, just being super honest, you know, understanding where that stakeholder is at and then deciding, are they going to help you or they're not and, and move on. Mm -hmm. I love it. This has been uh, incredible incredibly helpful for me personally. Um, I hope everyone has taken a ton of tactics. Um, we're at time, unfortunately. Wish I could keep talking to you guys. Uh, maybe we can do part two. I don't know if that's against the rules, but <laughs> posing it right now. Um, but this has been amazing. So I appreciate the insightful um, feedback, thoughts, stories uh, from each of you. And I uh, hope this has been really, really helpful for everyone that's joined. And just as a heads up, um, we do have a takeaway for everyone that has joined. Uh, we do have a really lightweight a account mapping and stakeholder mapping template that you guys can use. Um, I've used it. A lot of teams have used it. It's a really, really great way to get started um, building those relationships and uh, driving and unlocking customer growth. Uh, but thank you all so much for attending today. This has been awesome and appreciate the time. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. everybody.